Hey, Crime Salad listeners, welcome back to another episode of Crime Salad, where we talk true crime. My name's Ashley. And I'm Ricky. And before we jump into this week's episode, we do have a few lovely patrons to shout out. We have Megan, Jean, Cece, and Lee. Thank you guys so much for your support. Yes. Today's episode is part two and the conclusion to the Michelle Young murder case. If you haven't listened to part one, don't go any further. Pause now and go back an episode before continuing on. So where we left off, Jason was following his attorney's advice and refusing to give a statement on his whereabouts on the night Michelle was murdered. His silence was also frustrating Michelle's family and friends. Jason and Michelle both had a core group of overlapping friends from North Carolina State. The group was self-named the Wolfpack due to their season tickets to their alma mater's football and basketball games, which centered around their social lives. Michelle Money was an integral part of that group, and she was Michelle's best friend in her sorority. Michelle Money testified that she and Michelle Fisher, as she was known back then, became best friends on a bus as they were both from Long Island and had the same name. She described Michelle as very loving, caring, organized, and meticulous. She stated she first met Jason at her own wedding when he attended as Michelle Fisher's date. However, she didn't really get to know him until 2006. So it was shocking that within weeks of Michelle's murder that their friend group discovered one of their very own had been betraying Michelle in the worst possible way right behind her back. Now, six days before Michelle died, Jason texted Michelle money in Florida, professing his love to her. He stated, I feel lucky just to know you, much less love you, but I do. I don't know how all of this happened, but I know how it will end up, two broken hearts. But I don't care. I know there is pain in my future, but you are so worth it, even if it's only for a blink in time. Michelle responded by texting, I'm missing you so much. I won't even get into my husband's lack of romance, affection, attention, etc. I wish things were different for all of us. Miss you tons. In the days leading up to Michelle's murder, Money and Jason exchanged 400 text messages and phone calls. And on the night of Michelle's murder, they exchanged over 50 text messages and spoke four times on the phone. In addition to his affair with Michelle Money, police discovered Jason had also slept with a much younger family friend who was in town for a conference and staying at the young household. She was a newlywed, and as a teenager, Jason was her camp counselor. Despite professing his love for Michelle Money the same day, Jason was so sexually aggressive with his house guests that they wound up having sex on the couch, something she deeply regretted and later felt was borderline non-consensual. Despite Jason's many affairs, investigators were hitting a wall. They eventually learned that Jason and Michelle met in February of 2001 when Michelle was celebrating her 24th birthday in a bar called The Poor House. That is when the two friend groups collided. That night led to Shelly and Ryan Shad and Michelle and Jason Young dating and both ultimately marrying each other. When they first met, Michelle was working at Deloitte and Touche as a junior accountant, and Jason was working in pharmaceutical sales for Pan American Labs. Friends reported that Jason was never faithful to Michelle throughout their relationship. This was something that Michelle always suspected, but never confirmed within their friend group. Some of them regretfully covered for Jason and hoped he would grow up and treat Michelle better. After two years, Michelle was ready to get married and start their lives. 
However, Jason acted like he was still waiting for something better to come along. But when Michelle got pregnant with Cassidy, it was time for him to make a decision. According to Michelle's closest friends, Jason accused Michelle of getting pregnant on purpose to trap him into marriage. He told her if she didn't abort the baby, he would hold it against her and the baby for the rest of their lives. Jason, who was a self-described mama's boy, asked his mother what he should do. And she said, if you love her, then you should marry her. Pat Young adored Michelle and thought Michelle's type A personality was just what her immature son needed in his life. Now, Michelle's mom, Linda Fisher, had slightly different advice for her pregnant daughter. She told Jason, if you don't love my daughter, then walk away. She'll survive and she doesn't need you. And so began their rocky relationship. Ultimately, the two were forced to get married at the justice of the peace because Michelle had quit her job. She was working at a temporary job and she no longer had medical benefits and needed Jason's insurance to pay for Cassidy's birth. And later they had a bigger wedding after Cassidy was born, which was planned exclusively by Michelle herself and her mother, Linda. Jason would later say that he was happy to be excluded from the planning and merely wanted to know when and where to show up. By all accounts, Jason was an involved and doting father who loved his daughter, although he really wanted a son to carry on his family name. Regardless, Jason was outwardly happy about the new addition to the family and told everyone he loved being a father. When Cassidy's daycare provider congratulated him, he said thank you, but he only agreed because he knew that it meant that they would have sex more often while trying. Now, remember when we said that Jason was always looking for something more? Well, police discovered correspondence on Jason's computer, which he sent to several other women. One was on September 12, 2006, to an ex-fiancé named Genevieve. About seven weeks before Michelle's murder, he was professing his love to her and clearly hoping to rekindle an old flame. While Michelle was getting excited for the new baby and making plans for her baby's needs and also being a mom to her two-and-a-half-year-old daughter Cassidy, her husband Jason was making plans to move on and find the happiness he said had eluded him. He wrote in part to Genevieve, I outwardly moved on from you, but I'm not sure my heart and my soul did. I now have a family, career, and a totally different life. I have a daughter who I never realized a person could love so much. I am happy, but I don't feel complete. Will I ever? In my heart, I sometimes imagine that our paths will cross again, as old people in a different life, in heaven, or however you want to think of it. That's what I do to suffice myself when you're strongly embedded in my thoughts. You're the psychologist specialist, am I going crazy? Does any part of your mind have these thoughts or are they completely buried? I know the possible negative outcomes from this correspondence and don't want to put either of us in jeopardy. I just need to open my heart for a minute to tell you how I feel because the possibility of leaving this world without expressing your love and passion would be a travesty. The biggest mistake I ever made was asking you to marry me when I did. I wish we could have dated and grown in maturity a few more years together, but it simply wasn't meant to be. Timing is almost as important as love and feelings. It just doesn't withstand eternity, which unfortunately for me is what I have to live with now. I can remember moments with you like they just happened. I remember breaking apart after our failed engagement and then being drawn back again. I remember you hugging and snuggling on me out in Clayton and saying, this feels like home. Those are memories that I will take to my grave and I have so many. You made me feel love, true, passionate, timeless love. I will always love you even though I know we will never be together. I still somehow think we will one day find each other and that might be totally one-sided. It might be a fantasy I've created for myself to get by. I don't know if our love was as profound for you. I actually hope it wasn't. I have rambled far too much already. I've got so much I want to say, but it would just come out as an incoherent mess. So I will leave it at this. I love you. I know that this is inappropriate for a married man to be saying this to a married woman, but I do. 
I always have and always will. It doesn't mean I will act on it or speak of it again, but it is what it is. I know you probably realize this now and it doesn't need to be said, but I will always be here forever for you. Please don't feel like you need to respond because that is not what I am looking for. I just needed to get this off my chest. Now, take your big fat hiney and get out of my dreams. I'm getting too old and tired for that nonsense, and it's been years since I've seen you. If you do insist upon these visits while I'm trying to sleep, at least gain 60 or 70 pounds and start losing your teeth, so I will wake up, call it a nightmare, and go back to sleep. You know, I could never end something heartfelt and important on a serious note. Always JY. This guy is just totally sickening. Knowing he has a loving and faithful wife and a beautiful daughter and a baby on the way, and now you may be wondering how this message was received. To say Genevieve was unimpressed with an out-of-the-blue profession of love from her violent ex fiance would be a massive understatement. At the time when Genevieve was contacted by police, she had shocking stories to tell them about Jason that included a frightening episode of violence, which ended in him forcibly taking back her engagement ring. His body language, he just, something in him was changing. He said something to the effect of, well, if I'm going to make such a terrible husband, then give me back my ring. Something inside him snapped. He physically came after me to get the ring off of me. He grabbed me by the arms and threw me down onto the bed, but with such force that it just, it stunned me. Um, and he grabbed my arms so tightly that it ended up leaving bruises in the shapes of his fingers later. And he was pinning my arms behind my back with, with such force that I felt like my shoulders were gonna pop out of the sockets. And then with all his weight, he would jump on me and straddle me and hold me down with both his arms and his legs. And then he would try to take his knees and pin my arms down so that he could then use his hands to get the ring off. And it went on for probably about 20 minutes. He cut my, my finger getting the ring off. Once I told my parents what he'd done to me, there was no way they would ever let me follow through on the wedding. So I told them um, and then molded over for a couple days and then I sent Jason an email and called off the wedding. It just blew my mind that he didn't care. <laughs> no remorse whatsoever. They thought Jason's removal of Genevieve's ring was interesting, given Michelle's missing engagement ring and wedding band. In the months preceding Michelle's murder, Jason professed his love for two women who were not his wife, slept with four women in total, and threatened to kill his wife purportedly in jest if she tried to move her mother into their home. Jason and Michelle's friend group had plenty of things to say about Jason other than his infidelity. In general, he was obnoxious, drank too much, and did what they all described as dick tricks. In fact, a few weeks before Michelle's murder, their group of friends were at Shelly and Ryan Shad's wedding. Shelly was the friend who was over the night Michelle was murdered, and Ryan was the friend who wanted Jason not to speak with investigators without talking to a lawyer first. At their wedding, Jason got belligerent drunk and opened his pants, exposing himself and making others uncomfortable with his dick tricks hobby. Michelle was mortified at her husband's excessive drinking and his immature frat boy behavior. All of their friends said that Jason lived for tailgating parties, getting drunk with old college friends and acting immature and juvenile. He was stuck in wanting to recreate his fun, carefree college days, and he felt like he was married to his mother, who scornfully demanded he be responsible and act like a 32-year-old man with a wife, a child, with adult responsibilities. But none of these things proved murder.
In the days, weeks, and months that followed Michelle's murder, Michelle's mother, Linda, and her sister, Meredith, did their best to keep in touch with Cassidy. By this time, Jason's sister was pregnant with her own baby and needed Cassidy's room for a nursery. So Jason and Cassidy moved in with his mother and stepfather. Jason would only sporadically allow his now dead wife's mother and sister, Linda and Meredith, to visit with Cassidy under the strict supervision of his mother or family friends. It was almost impossible to get regular phone calls with Cassidy, and they never knew when or if Jason would allow them to speak with her. Cassidy's grandmother, Linda, was incensed when she wasn't allowed to visit Cassidy for Thanksgiving or Christmas following Michelle's death. Later, Jason's mother, Pat, would say they were worried that Linda would kidnap Cassidy and take her to New York. But I mean, think how selfish this is. Linda lost her daughter, who was viciously murdered, and now she's being pushed out from having a relationship with her own granddaughter. On New Year's Day 2007, Jason finally relented and allowed Linda to visit with Cassidy and bring her gifts. Jason arranged a neutral site with friends, and they never allowed Linda or Meredith to be alone with Cassidy. According to Linda, the visits were never longer than two hours, and they were extremely supervised. They thought it was odd that Jason was never in attendance during these visits. It was almost as if Jason couldn't face them. During one visit, Linda tried to take Cassidy to the bathroom and was stopped by one of Pat's friends, who said she couldn't be alone with Cassidy. During the fall of 2007, almost one year after Michelle's brutal murder, Linda and Meredith were about an hour into their visit when Pat Young confronted them with a newspaper article. The article stated that Jason wasn't allowing them to visit Cassidy, which Pat took great offense to. Pat demanded that Linda speak with the media and retract her statements. Linda agreed, but Pat wasn't done making demands. She wanted Meredith and Linda to publicly come out in support of Jason and say they knew he had nothing to do with Michelle's death. She also demanded they retract their statements about Jason having an affair with Michelle Money. At one point, Pat screamed, you have no proof he had an affair. To which Linda screamed back that she did because Michelle admitted to it publicly and to the police. Linda said she would think about making those statements once Jason began cooperating with law enforcement and gave them a statement. Pat Young told them unless they publicly worked to clear the cloud hanging over Jason's head and work to get the insurance proceeds released, that they could no longer visit with Cassidy. And again, think about how heartbreaking that would be. This family experienced Michelle being brutally murdered, and now they are being threatened to never see Cassidy unless they make these statements. I mean, it could be that Pat was just trying to protect her son and was in denial that her son was even capable of murder, but who knows? And so, from that day forward, any cards or gifts sent by Linda and Meredith were immediately returned. They tried to bypass Jason by going to see Cassidy at daycare. And that is when Jason gave implicit instructions that if they showed up at daycare to see Cassidy, they should call the police. Now, Jason didn't know it, but that decision was the beginning of his downfall. Without access to Cassidy, Linda and Meredith no longer had anything to lose. Law enforcement had an idea. They suggested to Linda that she file a wrongful death lawsuit against Jason under the Slayer statute and declare him ineligible to receive any of Michelle's life insurance benefits. Since Michelle's estate was estimated at $4.2 million, they suggested they use personal injury attorneys who would work on a contingency basis. This would force Jason to sit for depositions and give testimony under oath pursuant to civil discovery rules. Detectives gave Linda's attorney full access to their criminal files to assist in the lawsuit. The statute of limitations on a wrongful death case was two years, and Linda had less than three months to get it filed. The ultimate goal was to get Jason's statement under oath to assist in his criminal prosecution. 
But they also wanted to have him declared Michelle's killer under the Slayer statute, which would preclude Jason from collecting on the $4.2 million in life insurance. However, that just meant that the money would go to Cassidy for her benefit and still would be under Jason's control. But they had a plan for that eventually, too. On October 29th, 2008, just five days before the statute of limitations expired, Linda filed her wrongful death complaint, naming Jason Lynn Young as the slayer. In the suit, Linda sought compensation for the horror, pain, and suffering of Michelle Young caused by defendant's fatal assault. They also sought reimbursement on behalf of Cassidy for the present monetary value to Cassidy of her mother's reasonable expected net income, companionship, comfort, guidance, kindly offices, and advice. Linda also sought punitive damages for Michelle's murder and asked the court to declare Jason as Michelle's slayer under the slayer statute, burying him from collecting or ever controlling the life insurance proceeds. To Linda's surprise, Jason ignored the complaint, refusing to file and answer or have an attorney appear on his behalf. He was taking his lawyer's advice to the extreme. He wasn't going to allow himself to be forced to give any statement under oath in his wife's murder. Apparently, his freedom was worth more to him than that $4.2 million. Additionally, Jason was still under the misguided notion that as Cassidy's custodial parent, he would still be allowed to control the life insurance proceeds, and this would get them finally released. But he couldn't have been more wrong. Sergeant Spivey gave an affidavit in the civil suit in support of Linda's request to have Jason declared Michelle's slayer. Judge Stevens read the affidavit in court and then signed the order taking Jason's default judgment and declaring him Michelle's killer. And Judge Stevens also awarded Linda $15 million in punitive damages for Michelle's murder. Linda and Meredith could now publicly refer to Jason as Michelle's killer and use it to force visitation with Cassidy. The first thing that Linda did was assert that Jason had forfeited his constitutionally protected rights as Cassidy's father. Just 12 days after receiving the wrongful death judgment, Linda and Meredith filed a custody action with two goals. One, they wanted a court-ordered visitation schedule with Cassidy, and two, they wanted to force Jason to appear for a deposition under oath to help with the criminal investigation. In the petition for custody, it stated that Jason had a pattern of conduct that had been degrading to Michelle, erratic and inappropriate, including extramarital affairs. It also discussed Jason's drinking alcohol in excess, including getting naked during social gatherings with friends, and it also included becoming stark naked while engaged in conversations and his frequent displays of penis tricks. And the complaint further alleged that Jason had not behaved as a grieving spouse would since Michelle's murder. It was also noted that Jason was using photos of Cassidy online to solicit dates, and he refused to cooperate with law enforcement in the investigation into Michelle's murder. The complaint further alleged that since Jason had been declared Michelle's murderer, he was no longer considered fit to see to her care, custody, and control. They requested the court to order a full psychological evaluation of Jason to determine his ability to remain Cassidy's custodial parent. Things were getting quickly out of hand for Jason, but he was determined not to give a statement that could later be used against him in a criminal proceeding. Two weeks before Jason would be required to enter an appearance in the custody case, his attorney had a proposed visitation schedule. Jason was agreeing to one regular monthly visit, unsupervised, and with one week in the summer with Cassidy. Linda and Meredith were elated. However, Jason wanted the agreement to remain informal and not through a legally binding court order signed by a judge. Linda and Meredith refused. They didn't want to be at the mercy of Jason or his mother any longer. Additionally, they still wanted a psychological evaluation of Jason to determine his fitness to remain Cassidy's custodial parent. 
In response, Jason's attorney sent over an eight-page document entitled Child Custody Consent Order. In it, Meredith was shocked to learn that Jason had given her full legal custody of Cassidy with him retaining visitation every other weekend. Jason had given up full custody of his daughter to avoid giving a statement regarding his whereabouts the night his wife was murdered. He couldn't risk giving a statement that might contradict the evidence gathered by police. And just around this same time, law enforcement had a breakthrough in the case. There were footprints left behind by the killer on a pillow next to Michelle's body. One was from a size 12 hush puppy shoe, which was Jason's size, and the other was from a shoe commonly purchased at discount stores for less than $10 in a men's size 10. So why were there two different sizes? Police believed the size 10 was planted evidence purposely left behind by the killer. However, when they were going through Jason and Michelle's financial records, they found a receipt for a pair of size 12 hush puppy shoes that matched the shoe pattern on the pillow next to Michelle's body. When police asked Jason about these shoes, he stated that he thought Michelle must have donated them. But police felt that this was the smoking gun they needed to finally charge Jason with Michelle's murder. On December 14th, 2009, more than three years after Michelle's murder, they finally arrested Jason Young in front of his mother. Jason's first trial took place in June of 2011. The preceding judge was the same civil court judge who declared Jason the slayer in the wrongful death suit brought by Linda Fisher. The prosecution had an uphill battle as they were never able to get a statement from Jason under oath and couldn't predict what his defense strategy might be. On top of that, there were three eyewitnesses the night and the morning of Michelle's murder who all saw similar things but at different times. Only one of those times could be correct and fall within the prosecution's theory. The first witness delivered the New York Times between 3 and 4 a.m. On November 3rd, she noticed that all of the interior and exterior lights were on at the Young's house. She also noticed a light-colored, medium-sized SUV parked in front of the Young's residence. She stated it was either a silver or blue van parked directly across the street. The next witness was a neighbor who worked for the Postal Service. She had a 6 a.m. shift and usually left by 5.20 a.m. each day. And she saw a vehicle at the edge of the Young's driveway facing the street. And she recalled it was a light-colored soccer mom type SUV, which Jason's Ford Explorer falls into that description. Her headlights hit the car windshield and she noticed two people in the car, one a man and one a woman. This could explain the two different shoe sizes found on the pillow in blood near Michelle's body. Now, this timeline didn't work for the prosecution because at this time, they had Jason at a gas station two hours away. Now, the third witness was also a neighbor, and she lived behind the Young's home on Birchleaf Drive. She had a regular hair appointment that day and noticed a medium-sized, light-color SUV at 6.15 a.m. parked near the end of the Young's driveway. This couldn't have been Jason because at 6.15 a.m., the prosecution alleged that he was just 15 minutes away from the Hampton Inn. All three witnesses were convinced of what they saw and the day and time they saw it, but they couldn't all three be right. Witness after witness described Jason as a deeply flawed person in a volatile relationship. Jason and Michelle fought often in front of family and friends, making everyone around them uncomfortable. It didn't matter if they were in public, at a wedding, at a tailgating party, or in someone's private home. No place was off limits for the couple to engage in triangulated arguments, often asking their friends to mediate or take sides. To the prosecution's surprise, Jason took the stand and overall did a fairly decent job of admitting to his faults, declaring his love for Michelle and explaining away the evidence. He testified on the night he checked into the Hampton Inn. 
he left his door slightly ajar and went out the emergency exit to get his computer charger from his car and smoke a cigar. This would have been highly out of character for Jason because he was adamantly against smoking, wouldn't allow it in his home or car, and made Michelle quit smoking when they first met. He denied propping the emergency door open with a landscape rock and said he must not have been the only person with the idea to prop that door open. Instead, he used landscaping sticks to prevent the door from closing all of the way. Landscaping sticks? He said the same thing for his room door, which is why it only registered opening once after he checked into his room. Jason testified that he was worried at the late hour and didn't want to disturb his neighbors by opening and closing his door. Instead, he left it slightly ajar where it looked closed, but it wasn't completely shut. He denied tampering with the camera and the touch DNA and fingerprints found near the camera didn't belong to him. However, the partial DNA profile on the red landscaping rock couldn't be ruled out as belonging to him. The prosecution was absolutely livid because they had less than an hour lunch break to prepare for Jason's cross-examination. As evidence by the result, it didn't go very well. On direct examination, Jason had already admitted to all of his flaws and came off sincere and contrite. He explained giving away custody of his daughter due to his financial condition. He said because of rumors on the internet surrounding his involvement in Michelle's death, he couldn't retain employment, was living with his mother, and couldn't afford to engage in a custody battle. He explained that he knew his arrest was going to happen, and he planned to clear his name and regain custody of his daughter at a later time. On cross-examination, he admitted that he let the wrongful death case go to default because, again, he was following his lawyer's advice. He admitted he didn't want to give a statement on the record, and he knew once he cleared his name criminally, he could go back and reopen the wrongful death case and clear his name. Jason also had forensics on his side. There were several fingerprints in the master bedroom that didn't belong to him. There was also an unknown hair with root attached that also didn't belong to him. The inference being that it could have belonged to the killer. There was also a mixture of two different DNA profiles on Michelle's jewelry box. Both excluded Jason as a contributor. Even though the prosecution's case was all circumstantial, they were shocked when the jury was deadlocked. Eight jurors voted for not guilty, and four jurors voted for guilty. With that, Judge Stevens was forced to call a mistrial. As a result, Jason was led out on a $900,000 bond, which was put up by his mother pending the second trial, which happened seven months later. And so the second trial began in March of 2012, and there were several more witnesses this time around. The prosecution had the advantage this time since Jason had testified in the first trial and they could plan their case around his defense. The trial started off with the prosecution's star witness, Gracie Doms. If you remember her, she was the clerk at the gas station who placed Jason an hour away from his hotel on the morning of the murder. Unfortunately, the defense was able to destroy her credibility. It turns out she was never shown a photo lineup by police. Instead, she was shown a photo of Jason, which she said she allegedly recognized. However, in deposition, when she was asked to describe Jason, she said that he was almost her same height and had some hair. Jason was 6'1 and had a full head of long hair. She also admitted that she was on disability since childhood for a traumatic brain injury and had memory issues. But the prosecution made up for it by getting evidence into the trial without proper objections by defense counsel. The first being the fact that Jason was declared the slayer of Michelle in a wrongful death lawsuit, which was signed by the very judge presiding over the criminal trial. Judge Stevens also allowed the custody findings for Cassidy into the trial where Jason was once again declared the killer of Michelle and excluded from collecting on Michelle's life insurance policy. Neither of these were allowed into the first trial as they were considered too prejudicial. 
Additionally, more friends of Michelle's testified that Michelle was concerned with the high value of life insurance Jason had taken out on her life. Cassidy's preschool teachers also testified that Cassidy would play with dolls and reenact her mother's murder, leading the jury to believe she witnessed her mother's death. The prosecution argued that only a father or someone who loved Cassidy would have taken such great care of her and allowed her to live. They described Cassidy as a living witness to the brutal acts inflicted on her mother. The prosecution also stated that Jason's silence during his first trial showed consciousness of guilt. According to the book entitled Absence of Evidence, this was considered improper as each defendant has a Fifth Amendment right from self-incrimination. However, again, the defense failed to properly preserve their client's objections on the records. Neither did they object when the prosecution played a video of Jason's testimony from the first trial. Jason had a right to refuse to testify and didn't testify in the second trial. Regardless, with the new evidence improperly admitted or not, the jury unanimously found Jason guilty of Michelle's murder. Jason and his family remained stoic throughout the verdict, while Linda and Meredith Fisher quietly wept with relief. But that relief was short-lived. Jason filed an appeal, and the North Carolina Court of Appeals agreed with him. On April 1, 2014, they granted Jason a new trial, citing that Judge Stevens abused his discretion by allowing the civil court testimony to be admitted at trial. However, on August 21, 2015, the North Carolina Supreme Court reversed the Court of Appeals decision, citing that Jason's attorney failed to preserve his grounds for appeal during the trial. And that left Jason with only one more legal remedy available to him. He had to request a hearing for ineffective assistance of counsel for his attorney's failures to object to improper evidence. The only problem with that is Jason's attorney was now a North Carolina Superior Court judge and clearly not incompetent. But at the hearing, he did fall on his sword and admit to things he could have and should have done better on his client's behalf. Unfortunately for Jason, on August 29th, 2018, the Supreme Court's final decision ended his fight for a third trial. Absent any new exculpatory evidence, Jason will live out the rest of his life in prison without the possibility of parole. We would love to hear your thoughts on this case. Did the jury finally get it right in the second trial? Do you think Jason is responsible for Michelle's murder? Is there enough circumstantial evidence proving his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? You can message us, tweet us, or comment on our Instagram page. Check us out on TikTok. We're all over social media. And of course, thank you all so much for listening to Crime Salad and supporting us. Check us out next week. We will be back with another riveting case. Crime Salad is a Weird Salad production. Are you kidding me? That was perfect. (laughs) 